Hey, hello. It is really nice to be here in Amsterdam again. So yeah, as Tab said, I've kind of been doing things on the web for a very long time. I do all kinds of things. It's very hard for me to tell conferences exactly what they should put on my badge as my kind of job. Uh, but I do lots of things. Um, as I say, importantly, I am the WTC representative for Frontiers. I've been asked to mention that we have a meetup this evening, which you can come along to. I'll be speaking at that as well, because I like to speak about CSS twice in one day. Uh, so do come along, though. It should be good fun. So really for this talk, though, I've been really teaching CSS for as long as I've been writing CSS, and that's kind of for about 20 years. I've written an awful lot of books and articles and so on. And one of those books was titled, Not By Me, as Everything You Know About CSS Is Wrong. And it was a ridiculous title. But maybe today I could almost justify using that. Because I've taught CSS and CSS for layout in pretty much the same way that everybody else has. This is a block thing. This is an inline thing. You can change the things between block and inline. Hey, this is the box model. It's very important, but it's also a bit weird. And then we do this stuff with widths and floats to try and make something that looks like a grid. And over the past few years, I've been writing and speaking about our new layout methods. I've been talking about Flexbox and Grid. And I'm constantly reordering my material, often kind of on the fly in front of people in workshops as, as I kind of hear questions that don't quite make sense. And I realize that people haven't quite got what we're teaching. And it's become apparent to me that the way that we have taught CSS doesn't really work with the new systems that we're creating. It's not giving people the ability to master new layout. And more than that, more importantly than that, I think that our continued teaching and talking about CSS as if it's some kind of weird, quirky thing encourages people to not take it seriously as a language and to do all they can to kind of avoid using features that are part of the language. So in this talk, I'm going to describe CSS layout as a system in a way that I believe we need to set it out, how we need to set out our stall when we talk to people about CSS layout. And I'm doing this not to teach you CSS, because I'm pretty sure that most of you in this room know a lot of this stuff, but to show you how to talk about CSS to your teams, or when you're writing articles or teaching people or answering questions on Twitter. So I think a lot of us are teaching, even if we wouldn't call ourselves teachers. Because I believe that if we want this language to be seen as a real language, as something important and elegant, and to be seen in the same light as other things, we really have to start talking about it in that way, in the way that we want it to be treated. Other languages, when we approach them with beginners, if we've got a complete beginner to programming, we begin with the important constructs of working with those languages. So, you know, if you're teaching someone JavaScript, you're going to teach them variables, basic math, string handling, conditional logic. You do all of that before you start saying, well, hack around with this website. With CSS, what we do is we teach a couple of things, and then we just start getting people to poke things around and hope that it sort of works. They're not given a robust way to start on a good footing, and it's no wonder then that people become reliant on frameworks or from going to Stack Overflow and just copying and pasting the nearest thing they see and asking questions even a very long way down the line of them working with CSS that make you realize that they don't actually understand what is going on in the language when they're doing things. So this is really my attempt to kind of try and create a robust footing for layout. And you'll notice here that I've not actually mentioned sort of grid and flexbox as independent things, because I think that by treating them as independent things, we're adding to this strange idea that when you pick between grid and flexbox, it's like choosing between bootstrap and foundation. Instead, we need to find the fundamentals and teach the fundamentals. And while you're doing that, you can introduce an awful lot of grid and flexbox along the way because that's how we can demonstrate these things. But once people understand the underlying fundamental parts of the system, the things that tie together the headline features of flexbox and grid, a lot of the rest is really just learning syntax. So CSS has a system for layout. It's how we lay out web pages and web applications, and the main layout methods all belong to the display property. They're essentially just a value of display. If you want to do layout, you are changing the value of display. 
So that's really the best place to start. What is display? And everything starts on the web with normal flow, with block and inline layout. We're always returning to that. And we need to understand this as the default state of layout, the state to which we return if we don't do anything else. Items are participating in the block formatting context. We often talk about this as kind of being no layout, but it's layout, it's block and inline layout. Each block box is a block thing or an inline thing. And if you write some HTML and just open it up in a web browser, there it is, your HTML document defining a block formatting context and the items inside participating in it. The block things do what block things do and the inline things do what inline things do and we have some readable content. Because CSS is doing some work for us there by way of the browser's inbuilt style sheet before we actually write any CSS. And I think it's pretty important for us to understand normal flow in this way as actually a layout method. And it's important for us to teach it this way. Because right out of the gate, CSS is doing this stuff for us. We don't need to define the way that every single HTML element looks. We don't have to worry about things overlapping on our page. CSS is doing that for us. How fortunate are we to have this amazing framework that gives us this great starting point for our designs. And it's very important that we work with it, not against it. If we strip everything away with a heavy-handed reset style sheet, then we're losing something really useful, something which is actually doing a bunch of our work for us. We have to end up putting everything back in. And so once we understand that we've got layout, and our items are participating in the block formatting context, we better understand what it is to change the value of display, to create a different kind of layout. My items here are displaying one below the other as block items. If I change the value of display on their container to flex, the items now display alongside each other. They're now flex items. They're not participating in that block formatting context. They're doing their own thing. They're in a flex formatting context. And that comes with some initial, initial values of the various flex properties. So our things here are displaying in a row by default because that's the initial value. Um, they're not stretching. They're all aligned to start. They're not stretching in the, on the main axis. So that's kind of the basic values of those flex items. Now if I change the value to grid, the items now participate in the grid formatting context. Now by default, when you create a grid, you end up with a one column grid. So that we just get a single column grid, it actually doesn't look very different. And so we need to add some uh, uh, column or row tracks to make something happen. So here I've added three column tracks and so I get a three column grid. But whether we say display grid or whether we say display flex, we're only doing that on that element. It becomes the grid container or the flex container and its children become grid or flex items. Their children go right back to doing flow layout. And we can see that if I add some more content to one of my grid items, a header and two paragraphs, they go right back to flow layout. And so it goes all the way down through the structure of your site. You can stay with that flow layout, the block formatting context, or you can switch to another form formatting context. Inside that, you're going to return to flow layout unless you make that decision again and change the value of display. One box at a time, all the way down. And once we're thinking like this, it becomes much, much easier to switch layout methods. If your flex display isn't kind of working out how you want it to, oh, well, let's try grid. Let's try display grid and add some columns and have a look at that instead. Does that pattern work better? Does this work better for the thing that I'm trying to lay out? We're not seeing grid and flex box as these two different competing layout methods. They're just values of display and we use the one that works best for the type of content we're trying to lay out at this particular time. And it's within display that we see this refactoring of CSS writ large. The display specification now details two values for display, not one. We're used to saying things like display grid, display flex with one value. The specification actually breaks this down into two. So we have an outer display type and an inner display type. The outer display type is always block or inline. And the inner display type is the one that the children use which might be block or inline layout, it might be grid or flex, it might be something as yet undefined. 
So when we say display grid, we're really saying display block grid. The outer box of this element is a block. The children of this box are grid items. Or if we say display flex, we're really saying display block flex. Create me a block level box with flex children. We have what is now termed in the specification, if you look at the specification, um, what, what are they called legacy values of display, which things like inline grid and inline flex with a, with a little hyphen in there. Now they would end up in our two value world as display inline flex and inline grid. This is currently just in the specification. I believe that Firefox have started to implement this, but at the moment you can't actually use these two values of display on the web. But I think they're very interesting in terms of how we think about display, how we think about the effect that changing display has on our content. So we think about our outer display type. That's how does that box behave in the layout? Is it a block box? Is it an inline box? That's going to you know, make a difference to how it behaves amongst all of the other boxes that are in our layout. And then we have this inner display type, the formatting context of the direct children. And that you know, might be grid or flex or what have you. But then there are things that behave a little bit differently uh, to the things that are, are part of display. We have things which break out of flow. They break the chain. We can remove an element from flow and it stops doing this nice thing where we don't have to worry about things overlapping um, and hiding your content. Now, the most obvious way to remove an item from normal flow and the one that if you asked a bunch of web developers how to take an item out of flow, they would probably tell you that it is to use position to set something to position absolute. That will very obviously take it out of normal flow. So we say position absolute and use the offset values and we take the item out of flow and position it. Now, as I mentioned at the start, by default, CSS does not overlap your content. So you can put some stuff on a page and you don't have to worry that things are gonna get hidden by other things. But the minute you start to use positioning, you're basically saying, hey, I am taking control here. I want to take this thing and I'm going to dump it on top of my content and that's absolutely fine. I'm going to deal with the overlaps. So you've kind of taken control back the minute you start to take things out of flow. It's your responsibility to make sure that your user can now read the rest of the content. And then there are floats, which perhaps if you aren't someone who spends your life reading CSS specs, they might not really seem to be an out of flow thing because they appear in the document pretty much where you expect them to appear. You know, the text wraps around, but the, the thing doesn't get lifted up and, and dumped somewhere else. It doesn't overlap things. Or do they? Because if you've ever added a background color to content wrapping a float, you see they actually are out of flow. It's the line boxes of the content that become shortened in order to wrap around the thing, but the actual box is taken out of flow. It, there's no space for it, and so the thing that follows it just comes up behind, and its background color, cover, color is shown behind the floated item. So again, we've got this overlapping thing going on. And so here we can go back and have another little look at the display specification and to the value of flow root. Our page establishes an initial block formatting context, uh, sometimes written as a BFC if you're reading specifications, and that has some features. Floats can't poke out of the bottom of that container. Uh, if this was the case, uh, if they could poke out the bottom, then a float could end up essentially ending up outside of the viewport uh, if, if it was taller than, than the content. So we know that doesn't happen. And sometimes it might be useful to create a new block formatting context in the middle of our layout to say, hey, this box here, everything needs to stay inside it. The floats, the margins, everything else should be contained inside this box. They shouldn't be getting out. And that's what display flow root does. It creates a new block formatting context, just like the page. It contains everything inside it, contains the floats. Now, this actually is exactly what you've been doing if you've ever used the overflow property to contain floats. Because when you use overflow, you get a new block formatting context because you're going to maybe have scroll bars and you need everything to be inside that box. So when you have your scroll bars, you can't have things poking out of it. So when you use overflow, um, you create a new block formatting context, everything stays in. That's been a little bit of a hack to do this kind of float containing behavior with the occasional poor effect of you know, clipping your shadows or ending up with scroll bars where you weren't wanting scroll bars. 
And also it being a little bit mysterious in your style sheet. You know, did the original developer really want scroll bars? Um, or were they trying to do this containing floats thing? And so now we have this value of display flow root that lets you just say, hey, right here, new block format in context. Let's start over with a new block format in context. Everything should stay inside this box. And then I want to talk about writing modes. Because when Flexbox and Grid landed in our browsers, they did so in a way that quietly introduced a kind of agnostic writing mode way of working with the document. Everything that came before Flexbox and Grid related to the physical dimensions of the screen. So we talked about top right, bottom left for pretty much everything in CSS. We talk about horizontal and vertical, X and Y. And when Flexbox and then Grid came along, we were asking people to think about start and end and the block and inline dimensions and this line numbering, which is related to writing mode. And this was quite puzzling to people. They're like, well, why can't I just say left? Because that's what I've always been doing you know, in, in my designs. Everything works according to the screen dimensions. And so these sort of concepts that are in writing modes are critical to our understanding of layout today. So before we do anything else, before we go do anything more complicated with layout, we need to understand writing modes. We need to make sure that we understand which way is block and which way is in line. So the block dimension is the direction in which blocks are displayed down the page. So in English, that's a language written horizontally. Blocks are displayed vertically, so one on top of the other. And the inline dimension is the dimension along which our words run in a sentence. So in English, that's left to right horizontally. In Arabic, that would be right to left. And these things relate to our understanding of block and inline layout, because inline boxes all line up next to each other in the inline direction. So if we use a vertical writing mode, now the block dimension is running horizontally and the inline vertically. So if you've been asked to think about start in the block dimension or line one in grid, then this is the line at which blocks would start. So in English, that's at the top of the page. In a vertical RL, that would be on the right. That's your block start. Where the blocks end, that's block end. And if you need to think about start in the inline direction or line one in grid, that's where a sentence begins in the writing mode that you're currently using or that the element is using. So on the left for English, on the right for Arabic. So this is inline start. And where your sentences end, well, that is inline end. And so here we find this tension between the fact that our new layout methods are pretty much agnostic. It doesn't matter which way up your grid is. It doesn't matter which way up your flex items are. And they refer to block and inline. Everything else is still tied to physical dimensions. You set your margins. You do it on top right, bottom left. You float things left. <coughs> and if you try and build something using a vertical writing mode, now that might be because you're working in a language that is, is set that way, but probably more likely for most of us is because we want to do something creative. And we thought, well, if we tip something on its side, that's going to be pretty cool and we can play around with it. Now, when you start doing that, this conflict becomes very apparent. Um, so we should be able to build a grid layout, as, as I've got a grid layout here, and I've got one of the items there is, is just in a horizontal writing mode, and I've given it a width and a height. Now, if we change it to a vertical writing mode, the actual grid layout works absolutely fine, but you can see that the dimensions are still tied to physical dimensions because a width is a width. It doesn't matter which writing mode you're in. So they don't relate to the logical dimensions of block or inline, uh, they're not related to the flow of content. And so to solve this problem, we have a whole new CSS specification, logical properties and values. It's essentially a series of mappings saying, hey, this is this in the physical world, so in the logical flow relative world, it is this. There are a huge number of these mappings, I know because I documented it for MDN, so I created an awful lot of pages for each of these different um, properties and values. So we've got one for pretty much everything that is a physical sort of a property or value in CSS. So with the example I just showed you, instead of using width and height, we could use inline size and block size, which then means when we tip our grid over, it stays with the same dimensions relative to the flow of the content. So our gridded component now can work in exactly the same way, no matter which direction the writing mode is going. 
If I am working in vertical writing mode, I often build the thing the right way up because it saves you having your head on the side like this. And as long as you use um, those logical properties and values, you can do that. You can just then tip it over. And so because we already understand the block and inline dimensions, these names should start to make sense. The block size property is, is the size in the block dimension, which is the horizontal mo writing mode in, if you're in height. Um, the inline size property is the size in the inline dimension, which in a horizontal write writing mode is width. If you turn the grid on its side using writing mode, the block and inline dimensions change, and therefore block size maps to width and inline size to height. This is incredibly difficult to talk about. You say <laughs> Um, and it gets worse because we have all these mappings for margin block start, and margin block end, defining the top and bottom <laughs> margins if you're in a horizontal writing mode. Um, and then we will have uh, margin inline start and margin inline end would be um, the inline start and end. So that would be left and right if you're in a horizontal writing mode. We have padding and then we even have border radius, which are my absolute favorites. Because you have things like border top left radius, which is bad enough. So that is your top left. So in a horizontal writing mode of the left to right direction, if you want that left corner, you're going to get border start start radius because it is the start of the inline and the start of the block dimension. Now, generally, you probably won't be using those too often. We tend not to use the long hands of border radius all that often. Um, but yes, they are my favorite for, um, for, for length, if nothing else. But in terms of teaching and understanding CSS, know that we are moving to this flow relative logical world. You know, browser support for these mappings is, is getting very good. It'll be a while before we sort of feel happy to use them everywhere. But in terms of teaching CSS, in terms of teaching CSS, they're really, really important because this is how the layout methods work. You know, they expect that we're working in this logical world. Grid and Flexbox make so much more sense when seen through a lens of writing modes. So once you start to think about start and end, block and inline, everything makes a lot more sense. Especially when you come to a key specification, um, which is, is part of working with Grid and Flexbox, box alignment. In this specification, an awful lot of what we do in Grid and Flexbox is pulled together. Uh, box alignment deals with obviously alignment and also space distribution between boxes. So alignment is defined for all of our layout methods, for flex and for grid, but also for block and inline layout, which means that we can have this consistent alignment no matter what we do, which, whichever method of display we're using, we should be able to have consistent alignment. And the reason that we need to talk about writing modes before we talk about alignment is because everything we do in alignment worries about these dimensions. The block and inline and start and end are how we do alignment. So when we talk about alignment, we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about the distribution of space between items in a particular formatting context, and we need to talk about the alignment of items within the little area that they're in. So they're two different things that affect the alignment of content. Now, the first, the distribution of space around elements. Now, I think that all of alignment is much easier to teach people if you use grid layout as an example, because in grid, we always have the two dimensions. And from there, you can then explain how it differs in other things. So if we have a grid here with fixed size tracks, they're not large enough to fill the grid area, the sort of orange box is the grid area. And that means that we've got some spare space to play with. Now, the tracks are all aligned to start in, their, in both dimensions. That's their initial values. So if I want to space things out in the inline dimension, I use justify content. If you're in grid, justify. It's a bit like if you justify words in a line. So the justify properties always work in the inline dimension. If I wanted to space things out in the block dimension, I would use align content. So we have justify content, space between, and I've got the Firefox grid inspector turned on there so you can kind of see the spaces stretching out as we give space between our grid tracks in the inline dimension. In the block dimension, we'll use align content. And that again will be space distribution, but in the block dimension. And this time I've aligned the content to end. So all that spare space has been put before the, item, before the tracks and the tracks are then at the bottom. 
Now, Flexbox is a bit different to Grid because not only have we got the, the block and inline dimensions going on, we can actually change the axis, can't we? We can say we've got a main axis and a cross axis. So in Flexbox, we justify on the main axis, which by default will be row if you haven't done anything else, which then is the inline dimension. So we justify on the main axis and align on the cross axis. So in Flex, uh, justify content is your main axis space distribution. So here we can say justify content, flex end, and the spare space is put before the items and they all go to the end. Align content is our cross axis space distribution between the flex lines. So you need to have more than one flex line and you need to have some spare space. But then you can do align content space around. And that's actually the, um, the Firefox flex inspector, which is pretty new which gives you some information about your flex items, their spacing and sizing and so on. If you haven't tried that out, it's really worth playing around with if you're learning Flexbox or if you're teaching Flexbox to someone else to have that visual understanding of what's going on. And here is the question I'm asked constantly and I have people reporting bugs to me with Flexbox and Grid saying, this isn't working, my alignment's not working. It's because they've not got any spare space. If you're using the content properties, you need to have spare space to distribute. If you have a tightly packed grid container, a tightly packed flex container, if you don't have multiple flex lines, you know, you're not going to have any space to distribute, and so they're not going to do anything. Um, this is very frequently reported to me. If you're teaching people Flexbox uh, and Grid, that's a good thing to point out. So then you have to align your items inside your area. Again, much easier to understand in Grid. I've got grid items here. They're all displayed within their area and they're stretched over different cells. The properties we need to use here are justify self and align self. Now, the initial values for those properties are stretch, which means that the thing that we tried to do for so long with floated layouts to have equal height columns is the default behavior of our new layout methods, which I kind of like. It's like saying, yes, you've always wanted to do this so here. Now you can just do it by default. If you line things up, they will stretch to full height. Uh, the only time that we don't stretch things is for items which have an aspect ratio. So if, say, you have uh, an image as a grid item, it will be aligned to start rather than stretch because generally you don't want your images to be stretched. You certainly don't want that to happen if you weren't expecting it. So to align on the inline axis, we again use the property which starts with justify. So justify self end. Uh, on the first item, aligns it to the end of the inline dimension. And on the block axis, we're using the properties with align. So align self end aligns it to the end on the block dimension. And we can set them all at once. If we go to the, the grid container, we can say justify items end and align items end, and they go to the end. Switch into Flexbox, and we do not have a concept of justify self on the main axis. The reason being that there's no area, as in grid, we're dealing with all of the items sort of as a group rather than individually. Um, so this is where we see that the specification is saying something different for a certain layout method. It's saying, well, this layout method, you can't do both ways like you can in grid. So here, you can't use this property. So we can't align individual items. We can, however, align them on the cross axis because you can move things up and down against each other on the cross axis if you've got extra space on that axis, perhaps because you've got a height on the flex container or you've got some taller items in that container making it taller. So align self will align a single item, um, align items on the parents will align them all. Now, if you do need self alignment of items on the main axis, there is a way to do it. And it's in the spec. You can use auto margins to align a single item or a group of items or separate them out from the others. Because auto margins absorb any available space in the dimension they are set on. It's why you can center a block with auto margins. You give it a margin left of auto, a margin right of auto, it pushes the block into the middle. We've all been centering our layouts like that forever. So if you apply an auto margin to a flex item, it will take precedence over the justify content alignment and kind of push that item over. Now, as we saw, this is described in the specification. It's not a hack. It's not making use of some weird behavior that someone noticed once on Stack Overflow. And this leads me to another thing about talking about this stuff. Let's stop calling things a trick 
or a hack when we are literally using CSS the way it has been designed. Because if we go around talking about this stuff as if it's weird and quirky, then people assume the whole language is weird and quirky and that it's just a series of hacks. And yes, it kind of has been, but it doesn't need to be anymore. So when you're talking about things that exist in the spec, show people the specification. Say, here, this is a real way to do things. This is how it's been designed. And while we're talking about design, um, there's some interesting things that you find that, that have kind of come out of, of CSS working group discussions. And some of these things are things that we spend an awful lot of time talking about. Um, when we design CSS, when we're creating this layout system, we want to prevent data loss. Right at the start, I said, you know, things don't overlap all over each other when we lay things out in CSS. You know, we try very hard to keep your content visible on the page. That's really important. Because actually, if things go missing, it's hard to identify that something's gone missing. If the button on your form has ended up behind another element, you may not spot that. It's really hard to spot that something's just not there. And people are like, how do I fill in this form? There's no button. If it all just kind of overlays messily, you will probably see the messy overlay. Uh, or at the very least, your customers will contact you and say, you know, I'm using this browser and everything's all a mess. At least you can go and fix it then, but they probably won't identify that something has gone missing. So we tend to have you know, visible overflow if we have to. Um, we don't go around causing data loss and hiding your content. So alignment is a situation where you could get data loss. In some cases, you could align an item in such a way that it kind of pushes part of it off the edge of the viewport, for example, out of the sort of scrollable area that you're working in. Uh, so here I've got a stack of um, flex items as column. They've been aligned to center. One of them's huge. And so if it's aligned to center, it's going to get pushed off the edge of the screen. You're not going to be able to get to some of it. That would obviously be suboptimal most of the time. So we've got these alignment keywords, safe and unsafe. Use the unsafe keyword and CSS will honor your alignment, even if that means something vanishes. If you're saying, I want unsafe alignment, you're basically saying, just like with position, I would like this, I would like this to work the way I've asked for it. And it could be because you've got some plans for it. You're using the fact that you can do that um, for some creative way or what have you. Now again, this isn't a hacky system. These things have been thought through and designed. And so then we have sizing. This is the specification. And so very recently was known as the CSS intrinsic and extrinsic sizing specification. I am not unhappy that I won't have to say that on stage so often because it's now being called box sizing. It defines how big things are in our layouts. And you might have noticed that at no point so far I've been talking about the box model. And this isn't because I don't think it's kind of totally unimportant. I think it's just far less important than it used to be. And I say that as someone who must have explained the box model in a different way at least 100 times across all of the writing that I've done, all of them with badly drawn diagrams. But when we had to control the size of each item in a layout, when we had to actually figure out how big everything was, the box model was really, really important. And also, because we all know that until very recently, the size we gave our items wasn't even the width they took up on the screen once you know, padding and borders and so on was taken into account. And I think it's there that we need to introduce people to the box model. So this is kind of my quick guide to the box model with added dev tools, because I think that's a really good way for you to see what's going on. Obviously, everything in CSS is a box, but the block level box is a very specific thing. It expands to fill the inline direction and it grows in the block dimension to the size of the content. And we can give it a width and, and maybe a height. When we do, CSS has to decide what it is that we mean about that. And it does that while taking into account all the different bits of the box. So the box has the content, and we refer to that as the content box. You might then give it a bit of padding. If you do that, it's added around the content. And the edge of this is referred to as the padding box. The box might also have a visible border. If you do, then the size of this border is added to the outside of the padding, and this is the border box. And the box also might have a margin, and that's then added to the outside of the border, pushing things away that are outside the box, and that defines the margin box. So if your box has a width or a height, or perhaps an inline size and a block size, what is that size? Now that size by default is the size of the content box. So that's the size of the box before you've added on your padding and your border. 
So the visible space it takes up it is added on to the size that you've given it. Now, I think a lot of people find that rather confusing. And so if you want the specified width to include padding and border, set the box sizing property to border box. And then the visible thing you can see, so everything other than the margin, that's the width you've, you've set. And that's pretty much what people need to know about the box model. We've got keywords that allow us to toggle between the two different ways of deciding sizing. You know, do you want your size to be the size of the content box? Do you want your size to be the size of the content plus the padding plus the border? We don't need to go into all the history at this point. This is what it is. Here's how to change it. And then we can move on to far more useful things about sizing. Now, how is sizing worked out across all of our new layout models? So in the past, everything was pretty much a percentage or a length. You've given your box a fixed size, and in which case, that's the size it's going to get. Now, that's how we've been doing layout. We've been giving things a size so that they will all line up next to each other. We hope that that size doesn't add up to more than 100%, because if it does, bad things start to happen. And as long as, you know, everything fits in the line, we kind of get something that looks like a kind of grid. Now, having to specify everything in lengths and percentages and then doing the math to make them line up is really the way of the past because our new layout methods can do a lot of the work for us. But to understand how they're doing that, we need to understand a few concepts. And the important things to understand is what is the minimum size of this content and what is the maximum size of this content? Because once we know those two things, we're in a pretty good place to start understanding what the browser is doing when it works out the size of any individual thing in our layout. And we've got some keywords which they allow us to actually size things in that minimum and maximum size so we can have a look at it. And so they're a really good place to start. If we have a two column grid, we've got um, our grid items there and the grid items contain variable amounts of text. So the first column is set to min content and the second to max content. Now you can see that the min content column has kind of got as small as it can without doing any overflows. And so it's soft wrapping the items getting as small as it can do, and then that's the size it gets to. That's its min content size. You can use those keywords if you want to, to size your grid tracks. Now, the second column has gone to max content size, which basically means that because we've got text in there, it's sort of unraveled, it's all gone, it's stretched out as long as it can. If you actually use max content in a grid layout like this, you could well cause an overflow, because if you have a very, very long bit of content in there, it's just gonna keep on going um, and end up poking out the box, poking out the side of the viewport. But that's important to know. Things have got a max content size, which they can try to go to. And so any content-based sizing is going to be working itself out based on these min and max content size, working out how to distribute space based on how big and how small the content is. And to sort of understand that, I think Flexbox is a really, really good way to understand what's going on there. So if I've got three items in my Flex container, now if we use the Flexbox initial values, they don't grow to fill the space. There's enough room for them there, so they're all going to their max content size. And they're stopping as soon as they've got to that size. They're not adding on any extra space that they need. Now if I give them Flex Auto, if you use Flex Auto, things can grow and they can shrink from Auto so because they've all got an equal um, flex value, they've all got essentially flex one, they can all grow at the same rate. Now it looks there like we've got three equally sized items, but that's only because they've got about the same amount of content. If we add more content to one of the items, you can see that that item is getting more space assigned. It's, it's taking up the space because its max content size is very big. But then once it kind of gets to it all being full, then it starts to wrap. It starts to lose the space from its max content size, and the content starts to wrap. And you see the small items, they also start to wrap down to their min content size. But they'll not go smaller than that. Um, if you ended up with too much stuff, it would just overflow. Um, or if you had flex wrap set to wrap, it would then start to wrap. So that's kind of Flexbox is doing this thing of looking at the min and max content size. What it's not doing is looking at those things and saying, well, we need three equal size items, and therefore we're going to have lots of space around a small thing and push the big thing into a tiny box. If you actually do want that behavior, and sometimes you do, then use flex one 
Um, that sets the flex basis to zero, which basically says none of these things has got any size, share all the space out accordingly. You then get your three equally sized items. But the thing with Flexbox, it's kind of best used for stuff where you've got a bunch of things of odd sizes and you just like the browser to lay it out in the best way possible, not put big things in small boxes and small things in big boxes. Just have this kind of squishy, flexible sizing. Uh, and it does that very, very well when used for that job. Now, I've not talked yet, really, about browser support. Now, pretty much everything I've talked about is available in at least, at least one browser, if not more than one. But I think as well as talking about how CSS is designed um, and that it is a system, we need to really rethink how we talk about browser support and explain CSS separately from explaining, you know, what is supported in what. And you might say, well, what use is CSS that we actually can't use? But, you know, stay with me for a moment. If we treat this as a system, it's a system that's been designed, we then have software that implements this system. Now, just like when you write a specification for a piece of software that you're building, sometimes you end up needing to release it without some of the features in your spec. Uh, because it's still useful even without those things. But it doesn't mean that those things, you know, don't exist or can't exist. And it's a kind of understandable state of affairs. You know, if we talk about the fact that, yes, you know, there are browsers that don't support some of this stuff, and yes, it's probably coming. That's understandable. We don't have the problems that we had in the past, where browsers had, you know, sort of implemented different things in wildly different ways. These days, browsers do not want they're not to be interop. Um, you know, nobody does. You know, no one in the CSS working group wants there not to be interop between browsers on any of these features. CSS is designed by a group of representatives from those engines, and no browser wants to be doing something different to what other browsers are doing. And yes, sometimes one engine lags behind on one feature or another. And yes, there are sometimes bugs. You know, who knew? Software gets bugs. Sometimes a browser has implemented a spec prior to some major change and is having to refactor it, as um, we're seeing with Firefox at the moment, who are about to ship the updated scroll snap when they implemented an earlier version of the spec. But none of this these days is due to browsers kind of fighting out over CSS features. It's due to the fact that we do have this iterative thing going on where we're creating features. And these days we've even got feature queries, the ability to say, hey browser, do you support this feature before I try and use it or shall I do something else? We can fork our code accordingly. You know, so another part of this system is this conditional logic. We've got media queries, we've got feature queries. We can find out you know, how big is this viewport? Is my user using a touch screen? Does this browser support grid? We can ask these questions, get the answers, do something in our code to deal with it when we need to. And why is this important? Well, as people who care about CSS, and I imagine since you're sat in a CSS conference, you do care to some degree about CSS, we need to stop talking about it as this weird and quirky thing. In this room and coming after me are some of the people who have done an amazing job of refactoring CSS, of creating a cohesive and a sensible layout system out of a language which is like no other, because it serves an environment, in fact, multiple environments that are like no other. And just because it's designed for an environment that isn't like any other doesn't mean that we can't teach it in a robust and structured manner. We can give people the skills to use the CSS of today, the CSS that is coming tomorrow, and be able to learn to cope with the browsers of the past where that is necessary. Those of us who teach CSS, and that's whether that's within your team, answering questions, writing books or articles, speaking at conferences, let's change the way we're talking about the language. Don't burden beginners with our history. Let's keep the scars of the browser wars for our own reminiscing and keep moving forward, refactoring the way that we talk about CSS. Thank you. All right, we drink over here. Uh, quick announcement before we get started with the Q&A. Some people are sitting in the stairs, but there's still some seats in the middle and whatnot. Everybody just make sure to squeeze in. Nobody will bite. It is against the code of conduct, so that's fine. All right, Rachel, wonderful talk. That was a lot of fun. I have one quick compliment and question. 
I saw a bunch of synchronized tweets coming out from your account while you were <laughs> talking. How did you do that? They're just in buffer. I know my timings. Oh, man. <laughs> that is extremely impressive. That was very good. It's very boring. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Still, it was nice to see you coming out. All right. Um, first question, one from uh, Peter Kuss. Is flow relative stuff polyfillable via tools like PostCSS or anything like that? Um, I guess it is. And that, I think I have seen something. It's not something I've tried myself. Um, I think I have seen someone doing that. I mean, they are just mappings, so there's sort of no reason why not. I'd, I'd, I probably wouldn't use them particularly at the moment. Um, I think it's more interesting that we have them as a concept at the moment. And I think probably, I think give us five, 10 years, I think that's probably the default. So we'll probably use flow relative stuff by default unless we want to use um, something physical for, for whatever reason. But yeah. I think it's probably a bit early at the moment to actually use them for everything. Yeah. Um, a question from my own heart too, because I went through learning how to do CSS layout back in the terrible days of float-based layout. What are the most important things to unlearn from your old knowledge right now to act well in today's modern CSS layout world? Sizing. Um, typically, when people start to learn Grid or Flexbox, they try and size everything in percentages um, and don't look at everything else and then are confused by things which are kind of using content-based sizing, so something like the FR unit in Grid, mm -hmm. um, because everyone is so used to the fact they have to have control over sizing. And I think like with Flexbox, sometimes just letting it get on with it, letting it do its thing, you'll get a good layout. Um, but we're not used to that, um, and I think that takes people a while. Interestingly, when I teach complete beginners, they get Grid and Flexbox really, really quickly. When I teach people who've been doing CSS for 10 years, they're like, ah, this is all terrible, there's so much of it, it's all new, I don't understand any of it at all. Um, so it, actually, I think that what we have is very understandable, but we've got these layers and layers of history to, to break through. It's so good to hear that my stuff is easy for new people to learn, that's great. Um, Let's move it here. Uh, quick question about viewport units. They're currently the main ones we use are VW and VH, mm -hmm. which are clearly not writing mode agnostic. Mm -hmm. Do we have any plans for uh, writing mode relative versions of the viewport units? I don't actually know. You might know. Do you? I do actually know. It's, you? The, VI, <laughs> <laughs> the VI and VB units do exist course, for viewport yes. inline yes, and viewport do, block. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so those be around. You also have Vmin and Vmax if you just want the smallest yeah. and largest ones. Those work everywhere. Uh, ba -ba -ba. So you've talked about teaching uh, new layout modes uh, and whatnot. So when we are teaching new people, what do you suggest the starting point is? Should we start with grid before we go into flow or should we start with flow and then do larger things? Ab absolutely start with flow. I think the order in which I've gone through things today is kind of where I am ending up reordering my own teaching of stuff. Um, I have lots of spreadsheets of what has worked and what doesn't. Um, from when I've been teaching people or the questions that I get. And I'd be like, why are people asking me that question at that point? And then I kind of reorder stuff and try it again. Um, and so, yeah, I think that just starting from the fact that, hey, we have layout here. Mm -hmm. um, and then what do you want to change about that layout rather than fighting against it? I think a lot of the time, particularly with grid, people are fighting against the order of things in, in the document and realizing that actually if you don't need to change very much and you, you, know, you, you get layout, I think is, is, is quite a nice way to work. Okay. Uh, one final question then. Um, while you rightly rail against talking about normal CSS as being you know, cute hacks or anything like that, uh, dealing with legacy browsers, we still do have to deal with a lot of hacks. Um, so what's your like, uh, suggestion to how best to talk about that and how best to deal with the reality that we still have a lot of CSS hacks that we need to deal with? I think when you're dealing with that from a basis of, I understand CSS, I understand how things should work. And okay, you know, the world isn't perfect. So from that starting point, what do I need to do to get something which works reasonably well in IE9 or whatever? So I, I have a product which fairly recently still supported IE9, so I know the pain. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I certainly don't live in an ivory tower. I, I do real <laughs> web development. So, but I think that if you're starting from a level of, I understand how this should be, then, and particularly if you're working component by component, um, actually fixing the things in older browsers becomes an awful lot less of a problem. What is difficult is when you don't understand what's going on, you're just kind of poking things around and hoping that it will work. Um, that's not a good position to work from. But if you work from, this is a sensible system, sometimes we need to do these things for these old browsers that haven't yeah, caught up with the times yet. Um, that's easier to cope with, I think. All right. Thank you very much, Rachel.